I started out um, wanting to write a biography of the year 1963 because I thought that it was such a, an incredible story. And not just the Beatles, but everything that happened that year, but the Beatles are the centre of it. And then I just felt that that could be one of maybe six books that would, in, in their entirety, put them together and tell the whole Beatles story. And I went to a literary agent and he said, well, six books is a bit much for it publishing deal, so maybe three, and yeah. make them twice the size, and don't start in the middle, start at the beginning. So he helped me to shape that idea, and it became this, and this is the first of three. Well, yeah, beginning in this case, you've gone way, way back, you've started in the middle of the 19th century. <laughs> well, the Beatles really begin in the middle of the 19th century, you know that. Yeah, I, I just, you know, you had to start the book somewhere and I wanted to look at their family backgrounds and I wanted to, oh, the whole ethos of this book is let's let's tell this story, let's get it, let's try and get it right, let's do the best job that can be done and um, I just decided I would start with their families and I very, I, in doing the genealogical research for each of them, which I did quite deeply, um, I found that they were, uh, uh, John, Paul and George, all pretty much Irish. They've certainly got Irish blood in them, 50%. Uh, and in John's case, his family arrived in Liverpool with the potato family. And I thought that was a good place to start. Yeah, sure. um, so it starts in about 1845 with the Lennons arriving in Liverpool. Uh, and it's only three generations back, um, three generations forward rather, to John. Uh, and in 1855, John Lennon's grandfather, who was called John Lennon, was born. Yes. So there is a John Lennon in this book from 1855, and he actually had quite exciting adventures of his own, and I enjoyed researching all of that. That is it, it just an exciting adventure. That whole, it, it's a book in itself, the, the history of the families, because yeah. it's just such a fascinating It's a good history too, it's not, just a, you know, it's not just about his mother was, his father was, it's actually, you know, these people are kind of alive again in yes, this book, yeah. because they had interesting lives of their own. Much like their offspring. It's also the start throughout the book. Has anybody actually read the book yet, by the way? Has anybody managed to read it? Reading it. Uh, the two. There's, there's so many instances throughout which begin with the families where, for instance, at one time there's a Lennon living near a McCartney. Yeah, there's so many little instances where well. things happen that it's just amazing. That if you wrote a novel with all those coincidences and somebody would say, you've got yeah, no, and, and as a researcher, I, um, I spend a lot of time in libraries and archives of a book like this, and that's, I mean, I, I really enjoy the writing of it very, very much, but the research is, is where you're out there actually panning for gold. Yes, yeah. And um, these discoveries happen all the time. So I was in, when the first house that Paul McCartney lived in was in Sunbury Road, Liverpool, near Anfield Football Stadium. And when I looked at the voting records to see exactly when it was, and I wanted to get a sense of that, who was living next door but a family called Lennon. So McCartney's living next door to Lennon from, from infancy, from, from, the, from, from birth. Uh, and another one, I mean there are just so many of these, another one that springs to mind is I, I researched in John Lennon's family there was a priest, um, Father William Lennon, uh, who actually had a telegram from the Pope when he organised the bazaar in Blundell Sand in the north end of Liverpool in about 1900. And that telegram is still in the um, Catholic Diocesan oh, really? Archives in Liverpool. So there is actually a telegram from the Pope to Father Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> which when you think that 60 years later the Beatles are bigger than yes, Jesus, is yes, actually yes. quite a nice, little, <laughs> a nice little story. So, um, and when I researched Father uh, Lennon's death, which was 1921, I thought, well, you know, Liverpool was very strongly Catholic. And it had two Catholic newspapers. Um, so I thought that his death would probably be reported. And when I found the obituary of Father William Lennon in the Liverpool Catholic Herald of 1921, on the same page, just about two columns to the right, is an advert for Epstein's furniture stores. <laughs> and it's Lennon and Epstein on the same page in 1921. And this happens all the time. And part of the joy of research for me is actually finding how people whose lives haven't yet crossed over or haven't yet connected, are actually all in the same space at the same time, moving around, and these connections are actually there. I urge anybody not to skip that part, by the way. Some people will jump to the Beatles part, but you must read this history of the family. It's absolutely incredible. Up until the Beatles arrive, it is a fascinating document. Like I said, it's a book in itself. Really, yeah, it's um, there are a few people have said to me um, that with this book, you know, maybe this is going to be the last book on the Beatles, or this and the next two. Mm. 
But I'm actually optimistic that it will open up a new field of people's yes, literature yes, for other people right. to go and enjoy and explore, and other people with their ideas. And quite a lot of things in this book and the two to come are chapters or moments that could be fleshed out into a book or play of their own. That's one of the, you know, the lines in, in the pre-publication um, promotion. I think it was one of your lines. Let's scrub everything we know. Mm. The line that was, or think we know. Yeah. Because this book opens up so many chapters and so many doors, which are those opportunities. Yeah. You just said uh, it could go so many ways now. Yeah, people are saying to me, you know, your book dismantles so many myths. Can you tell us the myths it dismantles? <laughs> so I don't really want to do that. Um, and as a writer, I've kind of grown up a little bit in that I don't need, I don't feel the need to point out where other yes, books yeah. have done something. I just want to tell the story, and the myths can just kind of fall away at the side. So, one of the early myths, we get to the point where the Beatles do arrive, you've got young John with his mother and father, yes. and there's always been the story of how he ran off down the road after Julie when he's had to choose between his mother and his father. Mm -hmm. Mark actually traced somebody who witnessed the incident. Yeah. He was there in the house. Yeah, a lovely guy called Billy Hall, who, um, in whose house this event took place. Um, you see it in all the films, that kind of John Lennon forced to choose between his parents, a terrible moment in the life of any child. Uh, choosing his, uh, first of all choosing his father, then his mother walks off dejectedly and he runs after her, money, money. I mean, that is very dramatic, but actually even more dramatic is the true story, which is less cinematically obvious than that, but, but definitely more real. Um, and it all happened in the house of this guy called Billy Hall, who was a friend of Alf Lennon's, John, John's, dad, John's dad, also known as Freddie, but mostly known as Alf. So in this book he's Alf all the way through it. <coughs> And um, it's just fantastic to have actually tracked down a guy in whose house it happened, and he told you what happened, which is that the, the thing you get in all the books is they were about to emigrate to New Zealand, and that, you know, the Beatles would never have happened, but in fact that wasn't true at all. Um, Alf had to go back to sea because he was a merchant sailor and he was under contract to go back. Uh, and the only thing was he might have stayed with this guy Billy Hall's parents in Blackpool. Well, they, you know, they, they didn't want to be looking yes, after yeah. their son's friend's son, who was actually due in school in Liverpool. So quite simply, uh, Alf arranged for John to be taken back by Julia and to be looked after properly. The reason, and the word properly was accented to me by Billy Hall because he <coughs> did that. Alf was very pleased to have achieved it on John's behalf because actually the way Julia had looked after John does not really define properly in most people's minds of how to raise a child. And um, she was an extraordinary woman, Julia, in many, many ways, but didn't, hadn't paid particular attention to John's upbringing. So that was just absolutely great to have that nailed. And in the end, you, you think, well, um, this guy was just, you know, this story has been told so many times, and um, why hadn't anybody else found Billy Hall? You know, why am I the first person to have found him? And the answer is, I was just the first person to look. Yes, yeah. You know, I mean, it wasn't that hard to find him. Yeah. So, but other writers just hadn't gone there. They, they were willing to repeat the story, and I looked at the story and thought, how can I find out if this is right or not? And there was this guy who was 87 when I tracked him down. I lived in New Zealand and sadly died a month ago and hasn't seen oh. this book. But his widow and his uh, daughter have seen it now. Oh, and very happy about it. Mm. And he gave me lots of pictures of John's dad as well, which I've never seen before. Yeah, yeah great pictures. The, the story of the Beatles' childhoods yeah. is another fascinating tale. That, yes. And for the first time, I think, for the first time, you, you get to know the Beatles as human beings, as people, rather than. Beatles as everybody sees them up there, you get to learn how their characters evolved, how they became, yeah. what they became. I saw this very early on as a human story. It's, it's, mm. The word legend does not appear in this book, or icon, or any of those kind of words that are banded about far too much these days, for my liking. They're just people. Yes. They're just people and they have lives like all of us have had, of birth and childhood and school and all of those experiences, but they were unusual people. Yes. They thought unusually, and they acted unusually, and they lived their lives that way. And the consequence is what they went on to achieve. But, but they are just people. just people, and this has to be a very human story. Uh, and to weave, to weave the childhoods in with amongst one another is also a technique that 
suggested to me was quite a strong way of doing yes, it. And yeah. you tend to read John's childhood, then Paul's, then George's, but they're actually all in Liverpool at the same time. They're all going to see the same films at the same cinemas at the same time. Yeah. And I just thought that it would be stronger if I actually <coughs> put them all in there together. And Ringo's in it. Richie. Yeah, Richie. Richie's in it from from the beginning. He doesn't just come in in 62 yeah. when, the, when the Beatles His, his actual story is probably the strongest of all the four, really. It's, it's yeah. kind of, yeah. His, his early childhood when he was ill. Yeah. He's got more details about his stays in hospital, his yeah. lack of schooling and everything he went through. It's almost like a, a Ringo biography. Mm. Uh, the first one, really, to, to look at it, look at him in anything like his death. They actually say, or Ringo actually says, no one's interested in my early years, they only want to go to Beatles. The early years is the best story. And he's right. Yes. It is yeah. a very, very strong story. Because how he got out of, you know, such a, such a, a, a kind of, deprived childhood and a very sickly childhood and became one of the four best known men in the world is really yeah. quite a phenomenal story. Oh, yeah. mm. And it, it, it goes on through the childhood to, into when to become sort of old enough to work and Ringo goes off to work. Yeah. George goes off to work, Paul goes off to work, John yes. goes off to work, which some people might find that's a fascinating little story in itself. Yeah. Oh there you go. Fantastic story. John John on a building John side a building as a labourer. <laughs> wielding a pickaxe for six weeks and then getting sacked. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a lovely story. That's yeah. brilliant, brilliant. But the, going back to Ringo, he goes into where Ringo was working, forming this little group with his mates at work, mm. playing in the dinner hour sort of <laughs> for the people. Yeah, factory. well the quarry men were a school group, a school skiffle group, they were called the quarry men because of Quarry Bank High School. Um, yeah, this is the first ever photograph of any group playing any venue in Liverpool. This is May the 23rd, 1957, and it's the Eddie Clayton Skiffle Group. The quarry men are a school group, but the Eddie Clayton Skiffle Group are a works skiffle group. They all work in the same factory. Uh, they're making playground equipment and uh, gymnasium equipment. Ringo actually helped make the diving board for the 1958 Empire Games. Uh, and, and England won a gold medal off that diving board. And I think that must have been quite a proud moment in that family. It's like how Richie made that diving board. Um, so Richie is there on the left playing drums standing up because where he lived in Liverpool, which was kind of, it's always called the Dingle, but it's actually kind of the toxic end of the Dingle. Um, if you go out with a drum kit, it, it's certainly in 1957-58, if you go outside with a drum kit, with all the gangs around, of which he was a member of one of them, um, you'd be jumped on, and the kit would be in pieces. So he could only go out and play drums with whatever he could actually physically carry in one go. And of course he had to ride the bus to get yes. there, so the drum kit would have been tricky anyway. Um, but, and his best mate is the guy in the middle, Roy Trafford, singing at the microphone. Eddie Clayton himself is on the right there. But Roy Trafford's in the middle, and Roy Trafford is Ringo's best mate to this day, because they all form friendships. That the Beatles' friendships that they had before they became famous are actually the key ones in their life. Because from the moment they became famous, they could never absolutely be sure why people wanted to be their friend. So anybody who's their friend from earlier than that, who's been with them through thin times, they are the true friends. So George was mates with Arthur Kelly until the day George died. Arthur's in this book. Uh, Roy Trafford's in this book, telling me great stuff about Richie at the factory and Richie and the Eddie Clayton group. And Richie just out and about, you know, going in the pubs to go yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Arthur Kelly's stories are legendary. When you and George's yeah. school days are yeah. such a funny time. Uh, George was George was always a rebel. Um, and when we've heard from. Um, John Lennon, a somewhat uncharitable purge of his feelings in the Jan Wenner interview for Rolling Stone, when he said George was just this bloody kid who was hanging around and all that. The fact is that George had enough about him for, George, for John to still want to hang out with him despite the age gap. And George was always cool, he was always the best dresser, he always led their fashion moves. When they go to Hamburg, George is the youngest, 17, he gets into leather first, and John goes, oh, I'll have some of that. And then you know, that's the group just take off. <coughs> some, some of the great quotes, I thought it was the language used, but that, there's a great story about school shoes, when you get to the school shoes bit. Yes. And George literally jumps over the wall at the Liverpool Institute, to just just gives up school. Yeah, he just disappears. Up. The last three months of his uh, schooling, he just didn't go in. He just didn't go. So you hear these stories about John being a rebel at school, but you never hear the ones about George. <coughs> the book, for the first time, yeah. explains that George was 
just as tough as John in many respects. And like I said, they got this very tough mentally. Yes. And of course, this is what they needed. Uh, and it was a meeting of tough mental minds yeah. and their tough attitude in all the years that followed that got them through it. One of the interesting things you said the other week in Liverpool as well, which I've never thought about, if anybody's ever been to Liverpool where the Liverpool Institute was and the Art College was, the fact that the school and the Art College were together meant that two from the Institute, Paul and George, could just nip through to see John at the Institute, and probably yes. without that link there would have been no big sketch there. I have not the sketch, no. Okay, there, the is, sketch. there is, in the book, uh, there is a sketch drawn by one of John's uh, friends at art school of Paul and George having nipped through from the institute next door instead of having the school lunches and what George Harrison called council cabbage for lunch. <laughs> uh, they used to go and get a bag of chips and go into the art school and sit with John and talk rock and roll and smoke cigarettes and hang out with a slightly older crowd. They're in their blazers, of course, but they used to take the badge off the front of their blazer and turn it around with a pin and put it inside. Um, and John's more casually dressed because he's at art school and he can dress how he likes. And the three of them, are, they, they did this for about a year or more, and I've got great quotes from people who were actually witness to all of this. Um, but one of the girls in John's year at art school sketched it, without them knowing it. She just sat and did a sketch in her sketchbook. And when I went to see her about five or six years ago, she said, oh, I've just found this sketch. And it's just John, Paul and George on the stage in 58 in the art school. And I just said, can I put that in the book? Yeah, of course. It's really? It's not very good. And I went, it's good. It's not just John, Paul and George. It's obviously John, Paul and George. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's done it so, it's a really yes. rough sketch, but it just captures yeah. that moment. Absolutely, yeah. You can yeah. see John with his drainies on and his glasses. Yeah. And he's been a bit quiffed. And the book begins in that in that situation. Because the uh, the book begins with a prologue that is just a moment from later in the book that I just kind of pulled out and put it at the front, which is John and Paul when they first wrote songs together. So it's about January 1958, and they are now suddenly John has been writing songs on his own. Paul has been writing songs on his own. They've met. They've told each other they write songs, and they've done. Should we do it together? And they go. They come out of the art school, and they come out of um, the institute. For the afternoon, they sag off, they get on the bus in Catherine Street, they get their bus out to Paul's house. But Jim Mack is out in the daytime working. So, and, and they have to go in the daytime because Jim Mack won't have John Lennon around the house because he's a bad influence on Paul. So they have to go there in the afternoons and they start writing songs together. And um, if they hadn't have happened to be at adjacent schools, that would have happened. So there's a lot of things have fallen into place for this to work. Yeah. We'll just do a quick skip here, but everybody will know that photograph of the quarryman mm. taken on the day John met Paul. Yes. And then we've got the first ever, or I think the first ever, colour photograph. Yeah, definitely the first colour picture. That is probably the very first time that George played with them. That's, I now know the date for that. That's March the 8th, 1958, in Paul's Auntie Jean's house in Highton. George has just turned 15 and looks about 11. <laughs> and, and John uh, is um, 17 and a half. So you can see what John meant when he was just, you know, aware of the age gap. But John Lennon was a very unusual young man in so many ways. And one of the ways was he didn't mind hanging around with younger kids. Most people don't really want to hang around with kids who are younger than them. But he did, provided that that person, A, stood up to him, and B, brought something interesting to the party, and George did both. So when John was needling George, as he did, inevitably, because he needled everybody, George would needle him back, and that was okay for John. I don't know if anybody's seen, there's a series of photos later taken in 62, the Peter Kay photographs. Yes. And there's a series where John and George are having an argument. You can right. see that, yes. You can see them both talking at one another. Yeah. Paul and Ringo are on the end, sort of pulling faces at the camera, just so you wouldn't be here. Mm. It's a great little set of about four yeah. photographs. Yeah, and as I say in the book, if, if you were a pushover, in John Lennon's world, if you were a pushover, he'd push you over. <laughs> but if you stood up to him, you had his respect yeah. and, and his friendship, and his friendship was, for any, anyone who had it, the best friendship they ever had, yes. yeah. because he would be there for you. What I was building up to here, we, we know about the Quarrymen, mm. we know about the Newark Twins, we know about the Moon Dogs, Johnny the Moon Dogs. But in the book, we've come up, or Mark's come up with another name, I should say. There's another name, J Page 3. Yeah. 
They went around as a trio for a while, and they called themselves J Page Three. Uh, J for John, P A for Paul, and G E for George. And three because they were just a trio with the rhythm in the guitars, as they always used to say. If anyone said, "Where's your drummer?" <laughs> because they can never get a drummer ever. Um, and John doesn't have a guitar there because the one that his mum bought for him he had smashed, which is an interesting thing psychologically. Uh, and he had just nicked one in Manchester, but it was so poor that as Arthur Kelly said to him, couldn't you have nicked something better? <laughs> uh, and they're playing there at George's um, brother's wedding, George's brother Harry's big brother, that's his wedding reception, yes, yeah. in a pub on Chilworn Abbey Road, which is quite nice as well, Chilworn Abbey Road. Not only does Martin know exactly where these are taken, he's basically been to every single location. Yeah, you, still can, exists. you can go in the bar and it still looks exactly like that, with that window there, that very distinctive arched window. That's research for you. Yeah, and um, that's the occasion which we, thanks to the Living in the Material World film that came out a couple of years ago, um, Harry says that on that occasion there was an elderly lady pianist there, a wedding guest, just tinkling away in the corner, and George John poured his pint of beer over her and said, I anoint thee, David. <laughs> and no one seemed to get upset about it. She just went and dried herself off and carried on. Wonderful weddings. Mm. Now, what about these poor guitars? This, this, you said something the other week again which fascinated me. There's a photograph again. Very early photograph. The opening of the Casbar. Yeah, August 1959. And just tell the story there about John's guitar. Well, um, we talked earlier that John worked on a building site for, for six weeks. Um, and it happened to be the hottest summer uh, on record for a period of time, so John was sweltering away and swearing away and having a really unhappy time. He did it for one reason only, which was that he wanted a, a new guitar. He wanted an electric guitar. And Mimi had said to him, she was never a great encourager of his guitar thing because she thought it was a distraction from his studies, um, which is perfectly natural for a parent or guardian. Uh, and she said to John, if you want it, show it. Show, the, show how much you want this guitar. I'm not just going to buy it for you. If you want it, work for it. So he worked on a building site and got sacked on the 28th of August, 1959. And when I bought this guitar straight away, the hire purchase form is dated. We, we have the date of it. Uh, and this is the next day. And he's looking down at it because it's a brand new guitar and he hasn't played it before. And that's his Club 40, which they always call Club Footy because they like that kind of thing. And the girl sitting, looking at Paul there, but actually, she, although she's looking at Paul, that's because he's sing, singing to her, she's there because of John, that's Cynthia. They've only just met. Well, they, actually they met in 57 when they started art school, they've only just got together. She hasn't yet gone blonde, that's how we know. It's very early in their relationship, because he made her go blonde like that. And that is um, John as a Ted. Teddy boy, with his lovely girlfriend, Cynthia. And two people at the back, Tony Carricker, this, this, guy, this is an art school picture. They're outside the art school. They're on Hope Street in Liverpool. And this guy, Tony Carricker, uh, was an ardent record collector. Loved rock and roll, loved rhythm and blues. Got the records, introduced John to a lot of important music in his life. Uh, and this guy, John Haig, was a friend of, of them all. John eventually bought him a house to live in, in Leamington, in 1966. And this is John Haig's car that they're sitting on. Most unusual for a student to have the money for a car in those days. But he couldn't afford to actually run it. So he just sat outside the arc with no petrol in it. And this amazing colour picture from 1959 has, uh, has been around a little while, but it's great to see it. And it still looks the same today, that scene. It does, absolutely. It's a great one. Yeah. And that's, that's the other thing, John, this is where the influence is starting to show real yes. meter now. John's getting into his rock and roll, Bridget Bardot for his, for his girlfriend. Yes. They started to get this little identity yeah. between rockers and... Yeah, he's a good friend of Stuart's by this point. By and this time, the Stuart's involved. Yeah. yeah. And John invites Stuart to join them, to buy a bass guitar and join them. This is the first ever photograph of the Beatles. It's actually a slight cheat. It's actually mm -hmm. two pictures spliced together because it's the first occasion that they ever did anything with a photographer and he didn't quite get them all together. But this one, this one works. Just like if you take a picture like that and like that, these days digitally you can put them together. That's what this is. It's the audition 
to back Billy Fury in a summer season on Great Yarmouth Pier in the summer of 1960, which they failed. They were really quite poor at this point. Um, this drummer, you can just about make him out between John and Paul there, Tommy Moore. They'd never met him before this occasion. So there was no way this was going to be a good audition because you know he didn't know them and they didn't know him. And Stuart was a beginner on bass. Did become a good player. It's a myth that he couldn't play, but he did begin as a, a novice in editing. Um, they told him whatever they knew, but they didn't know much about bass either. Uh, so Paul got him to stand with his back like that. It was actually Paul's idea that he should stand like that. Um, partly because Paul was embarrassed at, at, at Stuart's inept fumbling on bass. Um, but didn't want to be the bass player himself because, as he says, the, the bass was always the fat guys in the street, like being goalkeeper in the football team. So, um, but Stuart joining the group was a big step forward for the Beatles, and his part, the part that he played, has is, never really been properly realised before, because he gave the Beatles a sense of artist, artistic direction. Uh, and when they get to Hamburg, he, it's his connections to the people in Hamburg that make everything happen. I mean, a lot of people have seen that photograph, but everybody, everybody will know that photograph. Mm. As you said it again the other week. Pete's never played a note with them at that point. Yeah, Pete, Pete's the guy they just picked up in order to go to Hamburg. So they don't know him yet, but he's a likeable kid, and you know, they've got on well, and they appear to be quite at ease here. But they don't yet know how good a drummer he is, because they've never seen him drum. Um, but they did know enough about him to know they didn't really want him. That's when they get there. And this is... This picture here is them about to start the very first night in Hamburg. It's the 17th of August, 1960. Stu in his James, James Dean shades. Uh, and Pete doesn't have the same jacket. They're wearing lilac jackets here that were made by Paul's next door neighbour, who was a tailor. Paul bought this material and said, can you make us some jackets, please? And they actually bright lilac. But they grabbed Pete so quickly there wasn't time for him to have one. So he's wearing something different. And this is, um, this is, what is it? Uh, that the old comic strip. Which, which that's one is? Yeah, that's, the, uh, that's an amp they've nicked, nicked from the art school. Um, <laughs> the art school bought an amp for them to use, but it wasn't meant to take it away, but they took it away and never bought it back. That's Paul's little El Pico amp. And this is the first good amp they bought with some money they'd earned in 1960. But they're really pretty rough at this point, but they're about to find out in a very unusual way just, just what it is about them, the, 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 about music that they really want to do. This is where they find out. George Hamburg in his leathers. Yeah, he's 17 years old there. And, um, well, that's as old as young George over there. Mm, when you think yeah. about that. Yeah. And that. And these are Astrid photographs, of course, I'm sure you all know that. Uh, Astrid Kinnick. Yeah. Extraordinary photographs of, of people who are, are not yet famous in any way whatsoever. They look like they're meant to be photographed like this, and I suppose in a way they are, but just so happens that, well actually I was going to say just so happens they attracted a good photographer to them. The thing about the Beatles is that even before they were famous, they were always attracting interesting artistic people to them because they were projecting in interesting artistry themselves. This is, this is the one that made me laugh. There's Paul and Tate, obviously at the same time as the photograph with John. Let me just swap photos again. Yeah. <laughs> well, Paul's not in his leathers. Yeah, Paul was always the last to buy something. Always more cautious with money. Uh, many stories about him, about, you know, always used to share their cigarettes around, but many stories of him just kind of sneaking his own one and not sharing around. It was funny, you probably didn't hear this when you said this last the weekend. I was sitting next to uh, the wife of a former famous Music Beat star. But when you said that, she, she leaned over and said, because he was a tight horse, that's why. Mm. Well, <laughs> and, and generally, he would wait and see where the others were leaving, and then he would jump in. So he was the last to, to, uh, to get the leather. But hey, that's, that's okay too. You know, when you have a band, let's face it, when you have a band of four people or five people or any number of people, everyone's going to arrive at things in their own time and at their own speed. Yeah. And we, we have this tendency to think of those who get there first are the coolest, and, you can understand that, yeah. but on the other hand, that doesn't mean that those who get there third are uncool. Mm. They just get there in their own time. Well, this guy certainly was cool. Stuart, extraordinary. Yeah. <coughs> Stuart, yeah, look at that hair. I mean, how did he get it to quiff up like that? <laughs> how envious am I that he can do that? <laughs> <laughs> and Stuart there is um, 20 years old, 
and it's his, it's him particularly who's attracted Klaus and Jürgen and Astrid into their world, and this is what they get from being in their world. They get photographs like this, and they get style. Not that they were lacking in style themselves, but these people in Hamburg, through their own revulsion of their country's behaviour, just before they were born, they, the, the Beatles were war children, but Astrid, Klaus, and Jürgen are war babies as well, and they were so disgusted at what their country had done that they shunned everything German and looked to Paris for their influences. So when the Beatles go to Hamburg, they meet people who are pushing Paris at them. And the Beatles essentially become England with a Paris look through a Hamburg filter. Mm -hmm. Again, that's another myth, sort of blowing out the water, the haircut. Yeah. It was a mixture of all sorts of yeah. little instances yeah. in Paris and Hamburg. Yeah, the, the John and Paul were the first two Beatles to get this out. Well, if you don't count Stuart, because Stuart had left, but actually he was first. Mm. Um, and they get it in a little left bank hotel in Paris called the Rue de Bonne. Uh, hotel de Bonne, in the Rue de Bonne. And the hotel is still there, it still looks exactly as it was when John and Paul went out to see Jürgen in 61, and they left Liverpool with their hair up, and they came back to Liverpool with their hair down. And uh, there's a fantastic quote from Neil Aspinall in this book. Neil Aspinall, who never really talked to any Beatle book authors, but did talk to me. And we had some amazing times together, and then he died, which is just very tragic. Um, said to me, it's the start of a chapter in this book, he said, you know, they just got back from Paris, we had a gig up in McGull in the north end of Liverpool and I drove the van, we went to collect John from Mendips in Menlad Avenue and John came out of the house looking and we all thought, well his hair's different. And he just got into the van, alright, and hadn't seen them in two weeks. He was, they were actually pissed off because John and Paul had gone away for two weeks. The Beatles had missed out on some bookings for that and they'd lost money. Um, and then they go to Paul's house, and as Neil says, Paul kind of bounced out of his house in that way that he does. <laughs> so, you know, kind of pointing to his hair and not going to say anything, but you kind of, he's definitely showing you there's something different. And they got in the van and, and things were different. And George very quickly, within days, modelled his hair the same way, and Pete didn't. And Neil said, and there was a definitely a gauntlet that was thrown down for Pete. Are you going to do this too or aren't you? And Pete didn't. And that was a decision that he took. Um, it doesn't have that much bearing on things, but it's a very indicative of the, the status of the relationships between the four of them. It was always three on one with Pete, always. Just going back to the Paris, it's actually a, a fairly interesting little sub-chapter of the Paris trip. Because like Paul just said, John and Paul go off to Paris, leaving George and Pete back in Liverpool with no income. Yeah. Losing gigs. And they can't come either. It's just like, you're not coming. It's just yeah. the two of us. And they've got there's no mobiles, there's no internet in those days. They can't get in touch. And when you're coming back, what are we going to do? Yeah. They knew when they were coming back, because um, the Beatles said, Bob Willer had said, no, sorry, yeah, yeah. they were going to go for a longer than two weeks. And Bob Willer said, no, you'll lose your audience. You can also think of George and Pete. Yeah. So they agreed to be back for a gig on the 15th of October. But they went for two. They actually were going to Spain with a stop in Paris. But they love Paris so much that so they, they stayed there. And that's where they came, they saw the colourless jacket there, which was not foisted on them by Brian, it was John and Paul seeing and falling in love with it. Uh, that happens in 63, of course, when they remember that jacket they saw in Paris. And John falls in love with Paris and takes, has both his honeymoons in Paris as a result. It's the best city in the world for John from that point, until he finds New York. So all this comes together, all these things start to weave together and you, you yeah. see things that happen, in, that happen in the future <coughs> taking yeah. form in the early years. Yeah, I, I didn't want to write this book with any kind of hindsight cleverness, so there's none of, as they were doing in 1967 mm. on Sergeant Pepper, I want this book to be like their lives unfolding at almost real time, and so you're in there with them as things are happening that they don't know about. You turn the page not knowing what's coming next, they don't know it either. So I don't have any of that forward-looking stuff. Um, what were you saying? What did I start saying? Just start Paris John and his honeymoon. Oh yes, yes. So I don't mention. Anything. I just say that John falls in love with it, and I, and I also I don't say this is where they get the PR card and suits from in '63. I just say they see these suits, and I sow seeds that will flower in the middle of February, but I don't actually give it away. Talking of fashions, that was the middle stage gear. Yeah. This is, this is them on the roof of the Top Ten Club in Hamburg on their second visit 
1961. And this is, as John called them, three Jean Vincents on the top ten roof. I'll let, you, I'll let you tell them what the caps are called. Yeah, they've got the yeah, they've got their cowboy boots on. I mean, this this kind of way of dressing <coughs> was totally uh, nauseating to older generations. People were disgusted with the way they were dressing, which of course made them do it all the more. They've got the cowboy boots on, the leather trousers, the leather jackets, the black t-shirts, because they always wore black t-shirts without the collar. Um, and on their heads, they've got these pink caps, which in Liverpool parlance. And because of the colour, they called them twat hats. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to wear these on stage for a while. They even wore pink neckerchiefs for a while, which I found quite interesting. There's no photos of that, but someone told me they swore it's true. So, yeah, this was their look for a while. They used to call it their leather suit look. And it's interesting that they used the word suit before they had thread suits. You know, they, even when they were in their leathers, they still thought they were wearing a suit. And all they did was exchange this kind of suit for the other kind of suit. And there's one of the great myths, by the way. Yes, maybe we're going to look at that. The suits later on. Yeah. Um, maybe we want to show that picture now. No. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Yeah, this is the first picture of the Beatles in suits. So it's part of a session um, of, it was taken in March 1962. Just after they got the suits, actually they didn't wear them in Liverpool much at this time. They 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 more kind of unveiled them properly in the summer, but um, the point is, you read all the books and it's always that Brian Epstein came along, became their manager, forced them to wear these suits, they hated it, it was great reluctance that they wore it, John said of course it would be sold out when we wore the suits and all that, but actually when you really look at it, and I spoke to the tailor who measured them up for these suits and fitted them, they helped design them is the actual answer to this. They chose the material, they, they wanted the trousers a particular way, they wanted the thread that runs through it, they, absolutely everything about it. In fact, they took ages to get right because the builders kept sending them back because they wanted it to be just how they wanted it. So that kind of gives a lie to this business that they didn't really want to do this. They actually were very happy to make the move. And much as you can find the John Lennon quote saying we sold out, you can also find John Lennon quotes saying yeah, Brian said if you want to get somewhere, you have to dress a bit smarter. So yeah, we'll do it. Absolutely. And you get quotes from all of them saying yes, yes. So it's like, wh where does this myth come from that they absolutely hated it? You know, it's just something that writers kind of make yes, up and void or it becomes, on. it becomes facts when actually there's nothing to it. Now, around about the same time as they were wearing suits like that, we'll get back to Ringo for a bit, because there's Ringo. <laughs> The Rory Storm and the Hurricane. Yeah, this is, um, this is the Hurricanes in 61, just about the same time that the Beatles looked like that. And when the Beatles got suits, they could have gone down this road. And uh, that might have been, as John Lennon said, selling out. But actually going for the mob look of really tight, narrow lapels and tight trousers, I don't think that was selling out. This is the Hurricanes about to go back to Butlins in 1961. They're out um, on London Road in Liverpool. And Ringo on the far left here with the grey streak in his hair, which he got from his uh, terrible illnesses as a child. And, I mean, I've, I've actually worn, this guy on the right, Johnny Guitar, his widow still has that jacket in, uh, in her house, and I've actually put it on. And uh, it's extraordinary jacket to go on stage in a jacket like that. Um, but that is what rock bands would look like if they wanted to get dressed up. And of course, there's the leader in the middle who's got a different outfit. And the Beatles were so original in Liverpool in not being someone and the something. It's such a, we now know the Beatles, of course, and there are all these bands called the something. But when they did it, apart from the crickets, which was their main influence, certainly in their world in Liverpool and in Britain with Cliff Richard and the Shadows and Johnny Kidd and the Pirates and all that, there was no, there were no other groups called the anything. So they were always original, and that's the, the thing that comes across from the book from the beginning to the end, is these people thought differently from everybody else, and that's why they made it to the very top. Well, another photograph here illustrating John and George, yeah. the closeness of John and George. It's one of Astrid's favourite sessions. Yes, well this was taken in the attic of her house in Hamburg where Stuart had painted, lived and painted. And Stuart has been dead about a month at the age of 21, and John and George go to see her. She's just come back from Liverpool from where she went to the funeral. And 
John and George go to see it, Pete doesn't go because Pete doesn't ever hang out with them at all, uh, socially. Uh, and Paul couldn't go because he had always been, he'd always bullied Stuart and Astrid didn't like him and he knew that and therefore he would have been inappropriate for him to go. So just John and George go and she takes pictures of John exactly. I like doing then and now pictures. But this isn't really a then and now photograph at all. This is then and almost then. Because it's only a few weeks in between these pictures. And John is standing where his, one of his best mates, if not his best mate, has just died at 21. And it's a stunning photograph. And of course the half shadow, the light coming in from the window on his left there. When they saw these images with the half shadow on, they knew that was a great photo technique. And that's what they wanted Robert Freeman to do for the With the Beatles album. So this is where they got that idea from. And it looks great here, and of course it looks great again when they did it in 63. Meanwhile, back in Hamburg. Yep. Enjoying themselves. The same visit. <laughs> As I say in the book, and it was something of a shock to realise this, this is the only photograph of the Beatles explicitly tying them to drugs. Because despite their great escapades later in the decade, well, from 1964 actually, um, we don't have any photos of them, not obviously holding a spliff or, or in, any, in any way drug connotations, but what they're holding here are tubes of prelude, which technically it wasn't an illegal drug, uh, it was um, a German women's slimming pill, it was an anorectic drug. The idea being that if you took the slimming pill, uh, you would have less of an appetite and therefore eat less and lose weight. They found, as others found before them, that if you took these pills, you could stay up all night and do seven hours on stage, no problem. And in fact, you probably want to go on and on and on, because they were like amphetamines. Um, Pete, in that picture there, is holding the tube, but actually he never took. So, and in the Beatles, there was always peer pressure to take, and he didn't take. So, another example of him not doing something that the others do. Paul took the least, George took plenty, and John, as you can see, took the most. <laughs> um, because that was their characters. John always dived in first and, you know, he'd find out what it was like and then go back and tell the others. George would be close to him and Paul would be waiting for him to say what it's like. And this same pattern is the same when they get into LSD, of course. Only three years after that picture was taken. Incredible. Yeah. I don't want to dwell too much on the on the Pete Best song. You have to. The, it's a long developing story throughout the book with Pete Best. It is, but but the, I mean, there are a lot of headlines, questions that people ask is, does it tell us finally why Pete Best was sacked? Well, the answer is definitely yes, uh, and you won't be in any doubt when you read it because it's uh, it's a pretty strong story. Well, I've got this for you. I'll give him back slightly. This is December '61. Mm. This, I think, I, I, I hope you. Can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Is the only photograph I can find of Pete with Ringo? Um, I can't think of another. This yeah. is on stage at the uh, Tower Ballroom in New yeah. Brighton. Yeah, one of Sam Leach's fairly chaotic rock promotions in Liverpool in New Brighton. There's somebody announcing there. George and John are on stage. George seems to be carrying his guitar lead. Mm. Paul is coming up onto the stage. Yeah. So Ringo is coming off, having done his set with Rory. Yeah. Pete's thinking. Where are my drums? Where am I going to stand? Yeah. And as far as I know, that is the only known shot of Ringo and Pete. Yeah, and that's December 61. December 61. Yeah. The reason I brought this, it's not in the book this one, but the reason I brought this is, this story's, um, I think it first surfaced when George in the anthology said that he seems to remember Pete being sick and they got Ringo in. And Pete responded to that at the time by saying, I was never sick. Mm. But Mark has found several instances where exactly that happened. Yeah. Pete was ill, so they asked Ringo. Yeah, the very first time was, um, if this, this is December 61. Is this, is this Christmas Eve? Uh, this is, it's around, it's, it's around that it's time. It's Christmas yeah. ball, isn't it? Yeah, this, they're advertising the Christmas go over there, right. so I think yeah. it's December the 7th, I think. Well, the Beatles had a Christmas party in the cavern. Mm -hmm. they, the cavern nights become kind of this one kind of amorphous hole in, in big books, but actually some of them were more special than others. And there was a, a really good early one was the Beatles' Christmas party in December 61. Um, and Pete can't play, doesn't turn up, and they get Ringo, and it's the first time they play as John Paul, George and Ringo in 61, and immediately they have a better time. And, and not only that, he hangs out with them afterwards, whereas Pete always used to go home. Mm -hmm. So they enjoy playing with Ringo, and from that moment on, whenever there's an opportunity to play with Ringo, they grab him, and it happens again 
uh, in March of 62, and it was then that George said, join us. But he was, Ringo was just about to go off to France to play with the Hurricanes on some American Air Force bases. Um, and so that doesn't happen, and then he goes off to Butlins, but at the end of that, they get him. For that first time, December 27th, 61, yeah. mm -hmm. it's four days before they went down to Deccan. Yeah, yeah. So at the, Pete, at the uh, Deca audition, they've already drummed with Pete and uh, with Ringo, and, and they know that there's a difference. Yeah. Well, that's an amazing story. But that, again, that's just a, one of many that marks on earth that will mm. explain the Pete Best yeah. story in full. There's, there's a famous photograph yes. in the Albert Marion, Albert Marion session. Yeah, December 61. Again, it's part of the myth that you know Brian hated them in leathers. Brian actually fell for the Beatles dressed like this and they didn't get the suits until March, April 62. So the first three months of his management of them, which was an extraordinary period for them, because his management of them was very, very strong from the beginning, though he was a beginner himself. He, he got it right from the start. He used this as, he set up this photo session, and he used this shot as his main promotional image of the Beatles. So he was actually promoting them dressed in leather for about three months before the inevitable change had to happen. That one. That's not in the book. That's no. Mark McCartney. Yeah. Took that photograph. Yeah. When they go down to Decca the first time, uh, well, the only time, uh, New Year's Day '62, they had no rehearsal for the recording studio, and they don't really know their way about the studio and what it's going to feel like to be in one. When they go down the second uh, to the, for the second experience, which is Abbey Road in June. Brian gets them three days of rehearsals privately in the cavern with no audience. Brian had a very good working relationship with Raymond Ford and Bob Wooler at the cavern and got them this private rehearsal time, so it became their space, their rehearsal space. And what you see there is Paul McCartney showing Pete an effect that he wants on the drums because Pete is obviously struggling to get it for himself. And Pete not only has the embarrassment of being shown how to drum by the bass guitarist. He also has the embarrassment of the bass guitarist's brother taking a picture of it. <laughs> which, you know, I mean, I'm glad to have the picture, but that can't have been a very nice moment for Pete. Um, with the camera that Paul's just bought him in Hamburg, um, which Paul immediately, at the same time, was using for some X-rated photo sessions that John and Paul had with a couple of birds that they had in a flat just above Parliament <laughs> Street in Liverpool. So, um, yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> Always in this story, there's a lot going on at the same time. This was... This is a picture I was really happy to find. This hasn't been published before. This is um, Hume Hall in Port Sunlight, uh, July 1962. It's the second time they played. The first time they played there, right? It is. Yeah, the first. Yes, yeah. And when they played there the next time, they've got Ringo on drums. It's the same venue. But you can see now it's mid-62, and that could almost be a 1963 picture. Uh, the three of them all doing some lovely gold groups somewhere around the microphones together. And you've just got the essence of the Beatles there. Pete is in the background there. But the Beatles were always a three. And, and by the way, I'm making these statements, but in the book, it's not me saying any of this. It's people who were present, because I wasn't there. Um, but I found people who were. And Pete Best's best friend was Neil Aspinall. And he was a member of the family as well, for complicated reasons. But he said to me, when I interviewed him, he said, before they got Ringo, it was always John, Paul, George, and a drummer. And that's Pete's best friend saying that. So it's not me saying it, it's, it's the family saying it, even. And you can see it there, it's, a, it's the three of them. The three of them are really the Beatles. Yeah. And when then they decide to let Ringo in, they never really let Pete in, or he didn't want to be in, or whatever it was. But with Ringo, they opened up, let him in, and closed the door behind him, and they were a four. You just mentioned the MRI when we showed that photograph, before yeah. I show that one. Yeah. It, again, in the book, you don't just get the stories of the four Beatles. There's also Brian Epstein's history, George Martin's history, which is fascinating. Mm. One of the things Mark had asked me to do, I remember him sending me stereo version of Rolf Harris's Sun Arise yeah. that George Martin produced and I, again I urge anyone who's got it, it's the stereo version to listen to because it is an absolutely wonderful piece yeah. of production. Yeah. George Martin, young George Martin, which he was doing roughly about the same time as yeah. 
the Beatles were... Uh, just at the time he was recording them, August 62. Yeah, August 62. It's yeah. just an incredible piece of production. If you want to hear that George Martin was ready for people of like minds to come along and join him, you just have to listen to Sunrise. Yeah. And there are all sorts of nice parallels in the book. Um, as I said, I don't give anything away, so... But for those who know some of the... Or much of the Beatles story, there are these little things where you think, oh, I don't know what is that's going to lead to. There's an incident in 1958 where George Martin's making a recording where he has to chop a tape into hundreds of pieces and then he reassembles it in a particular order. Well, nine years later with the Beatles, when they're making Mr. Kite, he chops a tape into a hundred pieces and throws them up in the air and reassembles them in any order. But the idea of chopping up tapes and reassembling them, he already knows about. And he's the only producer who thinks like that. Yes. And when you listen to Sun Arise or Holding the Ground by Bernard Cribbins, not only are they great records, but you realise that as a producer he was unique in London. Yes. Uh, and for reasons that we may not go into here, but I don't really want to spoil, it, spoil the read, he was very, very lucky to get the Beatles. But they were very, very lucky to get here. Again, this is a, this is the classic example of forget yes. what we know or think we know. Yeah. This is probably the class, the, the most classic yeah. example in that. Yeah. Yeah. How George Martin signed the Beatles. Yeah. yeah. It's absolutely unbelievable. Isn't it? Yeah. Realise yeah. the whole story. It's a combination of circumstances so fortuitous that you just kind of think someone's controlling this. This is just all made to be because it's just like otherwise. If it was fiction and you wrote it down, an editor would say, "Oh, no one believe that. Take that out." But it just keeps happening time and time again. But again, told by people who were there. Yes. People who knew the situation. There are so many more people to speak to than you would... You know, there, there are going to be people who, whose quotes you will read in this book that you will just fall in love with these people and you'll wonder why you've never read their quotes before because they're not in any other book. And the, and the answer, quite simply, I'm, I'm not trying to blow my trumpet here, but this, if you spend 18 months writing a book from research to writing to delivery, you can't go very deep. You haven't got time to go very deep. But if you are prepared to go deep and try and tell the story, then you start finding all these other people who are just waiting to be found. Like two girls I met uh, who, in, who briefly managed the Beatles in 1961 between Alan Williams and Brian Epstein. So what? You know, I didn't even know that. It's raining and they're cold, and it's quarter past eight in the morning, and they only ever went to bed about six o'clock. So they're not very good early morning people. And this is them about to go and make history. <coughs> like we do to be less prosaic. And what they got there? Yeah, and that's them a few hours later. George trying to stand in such a way that you can't see the black eye. That's why he's standing side on. Um, and Ringo with the maracas and the tambourine on his tom-tom there, which during this session he was so nervous about being in the studio and so daunted by meeting a man like George Martin, who was just so awfully, awfully up the crust, that he had this mad moment in the session where he felt that the track needed drums and tambourine and maracas, and he started hitting the drums with the tambourine and the maracas. And they took one look at him and thought, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> and when they came down next time, they had another drummer, and that's the only white story. It's fascinating for us. can't hear a thing. We've come so far away, 5,000 miles away to come, and, you, and this room is way too small. Mr. Lewis, I'm so sorry. I tried so hard to come. Is there a way to squeeze her in? No, we didn't. Tell her there are seats inside, just about, or lap seats at least. Here we go. Now this, this, <laughs> this photograph, can everyone hear okay? Yeah. This photograph is mentioned, or one of this photograph of this session, is mentioned at the very start of the book because of its significance with what we talked about to begin with, with the, the Lenins coming into Liverpool. I want you to explain. Right, well this is, um, this is the Beatles out and about in Liverpool. Um, if you look at any papers from the 1960s, early 60s, like Enemy or Melody Maker or Record Mirror or Disc, or any of the little glossy magazines that used to exist, you will see the photographs of, of recording artists would be them with a microphone in a, in a photo studio somewhere 
or them pretending to be on the phone to someone, or them holding up their record. The idea of actually going out on location, and especially an unglamorous location, is again an original idea. It actually wasn't the Beatles' idea, it was Brian Epstein saying to a photographer called Les Chadwick, go out and do something interesting with them. And he thought, well, they're making this thing that they're not from London, they're from the north, this was all unusual stuff. They've got a name called The Something, and not only The Something, The Beatles, which everyone in London said, change the name because no one will like you with that name. They were saying, <coughs> saying it to them in 62. I mean, this is not an early thing. This is when they, came, when they first went down to London in October 62, which is a part of my book. I begin a chapter with this. Everyone tells them, you'll never make it. Go back to Liverpool. And that makes them, because the Beatles, if ever you said that kind of thing to these guys, that would double the determination to show you. And this is them showing, yeah, we're from the north, we're from Liverpool, and this is us, and this is our background. But they just happen to be standing on a piece of land that is where the Lennons landed in Liverpool from the potato famine. They're on Salkley Street, which is still there, up the dock road between from Liverpool, if you're heading up the road to Bootle, it's on the left-hand side, close to town, there's these huge warehouses. That warehouse is still there. And this is them standing, though John doesn't know it, he's right where his family arrived in Liverpool. And I didn't know that either until two pieces of research fell into place. And this is part of the joy of my job and why I love being a Beatles historian. And that is the first of all, I always want to know where this was taken. So I went with some friends up the dock road looking for the right kind of warehouse that matched the image. And there was only the one. And then when I did all John Lennon's family history research and saw from the census returns of 1851 that Lennon's were living on Saltley Street and I thought, well that's where that picture was taken. So, oh, there's a hundred years between them. The housing's been swept away, thankfully, because it was terrible stuff I and mean, cholera ridden and rats and open sewage and everything. And this is three generations later. And John, I'm sure, died without knowing that. And I think that would have amused him and intrigued him and probably freaked him in some way <laughs> that he was right there. And so I knew as a writer that that was where I would begin the book and kind of bring it around the full circle. It's a lovely full circle yeah. moment, I think, yeah. at the start of the book. To think that where the book ends is where the book starts. Yeah. Which is where the book ends. Which is like, well, yeah, it is. Eternal. It is, like life like is a cycle. Yeah. Mm. Incredible. Yeah. Well, the, the book only goes up to the end of December 1962. Yes. When they were in Hamburg for the last time at the Star Club. Everything in the Beatles story happens exactly when you want it to. It's another gift to the writer and where you think oh, it was all meant to be. Uh, you know, when does John Lennon discover that he won't have to go into the army and do national service? And without, the, without the abolition of conscription, the Beatles would never have happened because they would have all gone in the army and that would have been. They, they would have gone in at different times. George would have been in the army from 62 to 64, by the way. So no Ed Sullivan showed for George, because he's, he's actually a border shot that day, on parade. Um, so the Beatles' final club trip to Hamburg happens to be, or end, on December the 31st, 1962. They're about to fly back to England to the release of Please Please Me. They get to number one, and life is never the same again. So I end the book pretty much when this picture was taken, New Year's Eve 62. Everything that they're about to do is in place. The management's in place, the producer's there, the publishing is there, they've got even Northern Songs is, 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 is in the process of being formed. They've got the hairstyle, they've got the look, they've got their attitude, they've got the songs, they've got the personality. Everything is ready and that's where book two ends because book three is where it just explodes. It's a lovely ending to the book, it just says, to be continued. <laughs> yeah, and then I use the word intermission. <laughs> and it could be a fairly long one, but uh, I'm on it. Well, there is so much more, more information than what we've talked about in that book that you'll just be absolutely amazed. For those who, are, who have read it, I can see nodding in agreement there. It's just unbelievable. We're probably all here because we know that the Beatles story is the best story of all. Uh, I mean, they're the biggest band and they've got the best story. Um, but though I knew that it had never been told properly, I didn't really know just what a rich story it is until I was researching this, this book. And I just had discoveries every single day, bar none, every single day. And it's still happening. Uh, and will always happen, I think, because this story 
is, is an extraordinary one in that if you, if you look on the surface, you will find gold. But if you start digging down, the pickings do not get thinner as you go deeper. They just stay rich and strong and like gold. And I just go, I go, oh, that's good. I'll dig a, dig a bit deeper. Oh, that's good. I'll use that. Oh, that's, that's good. I just keep going and going and going. And that's why it's a big book. And some of the reviews are kind of harping on a bit uh, about the length of the book. And it only goes up to 1962. Well, yeah. There's a lot to be said. You know? And if you really want to know who these people were, I'm not saying this, I, I wouldn't call this book definitive myself because that's for other people to do it. But you will certainly know more about them than you've known before, and I think you'll understand them a bit more, because I do. I do understand them more now than I ever have before. There's, there's, now you've mentioned the reviews, there was a couple, uh, I think it was David Hepworth that said on every page, he's yeah. finding, he said he said something like, I know quite a lot about this group, so, I, he said, so I'm amazed to find that on every page I'm finding something new. I know he's a music journalist, he's yeah. been in the music business for many years, so that was high praise. There was another one, I, I was quite surprised, somebody reviewed it and said, there's no real revelations. I thought, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I, I think they'd only be happy if I come up with the fact there was a thirteenth big yes, called, yeah. <laughs> called Cecil. There's more revelations in this book than there's in the Bible. It's like incredible. There's this this new. Can I quote? There's again as well. That there's no plan that. But there's, there's new recordings that Mark has found that they did. There's new photographs that they did. There's new. Like I said, the manager, um, the uh, the group, J Page Three. There's all things like that. Yeah. Somebody once handed me, the, the famous Beatles author, once handed me a list of sort of quarrymen to Beatles, and he said, "Is there anything I've missed out?" And at that time, yeah, I knew about J Page Three, but was right. sworn to secrecy, and I just had to say, "I don't think so at this point." <laughs> mm. I had to be sort of economical with the truth. Yeah. Because Mark, I think, wasn't J. Page the, were the tapes and the... Oh, yeah, they were recorded. Yes, the but they were sold at Sotheby's. Uh, no, the, uh, the managers, no, the, they, they had a manager, the J. Page they had a manager called Derek Hodkin, so another guy who managed them. Um, and he had a, an engagement book, which That's actually it. only had one date in it. Because they, only, they, did, they did something they didn't tell him yes. about, but he got them one book, yes. which was a run call. But didn't he sell those at Sotheby's or something like that? He sold that, that notebook, but he actually recorded them uh, on his tape recorder, he lugged his tape recorder to Paul's house uh, in one night in November 1958 and recorded them messing about for about an hour with their guitars. And then after he ceased to be their manager, he was a big classical music fan really, he didn't really like rock and roll. Um, there was some nice music coming on the BBC third programme. And, and he recorded over the tapes. But not only that, not only did he want... still got the tape. I've seen the box, but he has got Visa on it. Well, again, another mark, another mark of Mark's incredible research. He's actually found when the program was broadcast that, that he recorded. Yeah. Well, now I know what date that tape was wiped, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was interesting. Not, it's not interesting in any other way than as a storyteller. I didn't want to just say it was wiped. I wanted to have it in the book at the right moment that it's wiped, and for that reason, I had to find out when it happened. And the book has a very chronological structure, so that basically meant that. Along the way, for every anecdote I ever got, for every photograph, for every Beatle moment or moment from their childhood, I had to apply either a precise or very close rough date to when this occurred so that it would appear in the story at the right time and not out of place because it's very important that these lives will unfold and you know, that's part of the process. Fantastic. I'm sure, well, we're going to open the question. I'm just going to thank Mark before. Gentlemen, was first over there. Mark, wonderful, thank you. So, how come the director's cut, the author's cut, yes. the full fat cut, yes. which is gay thick, mm. not out yet? What was the process that enabled you to filter out the information you had from that to the full fat version? Because it's twice as long. Yes. It's, it's, it's that again, isn't it? Yes. Yes, so I actually, we, we haven't really talked about this yet, and maybe some of you know it already, but thank you for bringing it up. I actually wrote about twice that amount. And still though, he goes up to 62. Um, but I, wrote, I, I felt I should write what this story needed uh, in order to be properly understood. 
Uh, the publishers gave me a word count, inevitably. With, with, with a contract, you will have a limit how many words you should write. And I wrote three times that amount, from 250,000 to 780,000. And to their enormous credit, in fact, my editor Tim was down here, he's just taken his children out. He actually read the whole thing and said, we would like to publish this. But we do still need the book that we wanted in the first place, which is something for the mass market to, you know, cause obviously when you've got 700 pages of, 1700 pages of text, is a bit of a specialist buy. So I had to create this version from the really big one, which some people will find daunting. Um, but the, the key moment of the key aspect of doing this was to reduce the text without missing anything out. So what I cut out were layers and levels of depth and background and texture and context, not actually anything germane to the storyline. So if when you write, when you read this book, you will not be missing anything at all. But when you read the other book, if you do, because it's you know obviously more expensive, um, there will just be other levels, other layers. Because I do also try and tell the story of the whole British rock and roll scene, the whole rhythm and blues and rock and roll, where, where does this music come from, how did they get to hear it, what were the records they listened to, um, so there's a lot more of that in the other book, there's some of it in this too, um, so that's what it is, right. so it was a very difficult be, challenge, very so difficult. it would be like back this new album year where you think shit I should have went for the, went for the deluxe, edition. no this, this is definitely a complete book yeah, in itself, yeah. but the other one is kind of complete plus. Just point out as well <laughs> that the editing has been done by Mark and not by a team of people who didn't know. Yeah, it had so to be done by me because the point is the book is a weave of, of stories and lives, yeah. and when you cut something out here, you leave a hole and it needs to be stitched up again. And also, it has ramifications further in the story that if, you, if that, that's gone, this thing becomes the first mention and not the second. So it was a bit of a tricky task, but it had to be done by me. Please. Okay, it's quite a convoluted question, but David appreciates. He knows me very well. Um, I think the Beatles definitely changed my life spiritually and, and the way they guide me. We talked, well, Mark talked a lot about how there's coincidences and whatever. Yeah. Is there a point in your life, Mark, where you think that you were destined to be in the Beatles' story? And the second question. Was there like a spiritual sort of guidance? Because you, you, your head is filled with so much information, as is Dave's as well. Do you get a chance for anything else? <laughs> <laughs> it's, as if you, it's as if you, I, I'm yeah. waiting for there was a, you know, a shop to be called Lewison's like in Liverpool next to a McCartney or something. No, is there no, something no. That's, no, no. that you were supposed to be in that story? No, no, no. First of all, I don't believe in destiny. And I don't believe in any kind of controlling hand or anything like that. So, as I said, in the book it happens so often that you know, even I would be, in, you know, a skeptic like me would think something is going on here. But I don't really believe that. Um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I'm not into any of that kind of thinking. Um, me and myself and my own part in this? No, definitely not. No, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm a fan. Um, Got into the Beatles when I was five in 1963, loved it. Got my name in Beatles Monthly when I was ten, <laughs> loved it. Um, ten and a half. Ten and a half, yes, I was, the half was very important. I was ten and a half. I do remember the back of Philip Norman's book, the first time I ever heard Mark's name was, and in Pinner in Middlesex, there was mm. a 22 year old man who's. Mm. Yeah. Do, do you remember that, that little I do. And, I do. And that's probably where. Yeah, because he came around my house while he was writing what turned out to be Shout, and I played him some bootleg stuff which he hadn't heard. And uh, he felt that that was worth mentioning in the book. Um, but how have the Beatles shaped your life, personally? Uh, well... Can I answer that? Because I, I think yeah. your humour is very much Beatlesque. Um, well, yeah, I, I like, I guess, I've, I've always liked comedy and I do love the Beatles' humour, so uh, I do quote quite a few of their lines from time to time. Um, Which are in the book as well, there's lots of little mm, Beatles. Yes. Yeah, the Beatles always, always made me laugh more than any comedy group, so there's a lot of comedy in this book. There's a lot of laugh out loud moments as well, because they make me laugh. Um, can I give an example of that? There's a, there's a great one. George, in the anthology book, says about in Hamburg, all the wild times in Hamburg, and he said, um, 
there's, there's a, there was rumours of a club in Hamburg where the women were doing strange things with donkeys. <laughs> and Mark has researched the Hamburg scene and, and he explains that women are only allowed, to, only allowed to go topless and this laws restricted this. Da, da, da. And the last line says, and there were no donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a typical Beatle yeah. end of line yeah. statement. That, I, that, I chucked Thank it when I first yes, read that. That was a great one. Um, the only way they shaped my life is that I started writing about them when I was about 19, and I started to do research into them when I was 21, and I found both things really invigorating. Loved doing the research, realized very quickly that if you research the Beatles beyond just the obvious level, that you are quite often on virgin territory, because journalists, I didn't know this, I just assumed all journalists and writers did their jobs really, really thoroughly, and it turns out that they don't, surprise, surprise. So, um, so that meant it was all just there waiting to be discovered. You know, I, I became known as the guy who discovered when the date John met Paul, but it wasn't difficult. I was just the first person to look in the right place. Uh, and I'm the first person to have found Billy Hall, who was in the house in Blackpool with John and with Alf and Julie. And I was the first person to find these two girls. And it makes me look special, but in fact I want to know why the other writers didn't go and find them first, because we bought all their books and they should have done their job. So, but just to really answer your question, no, they've not in any way given me anything spiritual, except that they've enriched my life enormously. They're in my heart. Um, it's a story I, I love with a passion. I tell it neutrally and independently, but I love it. Uh, and I think that, that love is what takes me through what is really a 25-year full-time job. So if you're not happy in what you do, and you're not enthused by it, you're going to get bored. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I lead a normal life. I have a beautiful wife who's in this room, or might have just lived in the room. Uh, two lovely children, and I live quite normally. And in fact, I don't really push the Beatles much on other people. It's, if they ask me, I'll tell them, but if they don't, I won't bore them with it. Mm. Gentlemen, the back there, Hey, hi, Mark. It's a privilege to be. Companies under you know so much and loves them as much as. But I don't know it all. People say no, to me, no. "You must know everything there is." No one knows everything about anything. Pauline Sutcliffe mm -hmm. has got very decided views about yes. Stuart's death and John's role in it. Yes. Without giving anything away, does the book resolve that satisfactory? Yes. Yes, it resolves it in the most satisfactory manner possible, which is a quote from Pauline Sutcliffe saying that anyone who advances any such theories as John hastened Stuart's death. Does, don't know what they're talking about, and there's no evidence for it, whatever. I actually have an interview. That was what she said before she did the book in which she said it. What's your name again? Uh, Mark, uh, pleasure to meet you again. Um, you. There's, a, there's a maxim in history writing that you shouldn't write about history until 50 years have elapsed, yes. which is roughly the time frame for the book. Yes. Now, I'd like to make some comment about all these new people that you've dug out yes. that have never appeared in books before. Yeah. How happy are you that are their reminiscences haven't been coloured by what's happened since mm. since night, since so they you know they first come into contact yes. with Yes. That's a very good question, a very perceptive question. I'm I am entirely satisfied with it. <clears throat> First of all, when I interview people, I, I have, um, there's a thing in psychiatry called early memory. Uh, the third one. No, there's a, it's an early memory. Pro, it's a program that psychiatrists can use to unlock the memories of people that they're speaking to. Uh, and it, I take along, when I go to see people, I take along things that are relevant to them in that time frame and the Beatles at that time that we're talking about. Take along photographs, I might play tapes, I might watch a video or two, take along documents, letters, whatever I can find that actually puts that person back there. So often when I arrive at someone's house, they say, it's, it's a long time ago, I can't re really remember very much. And then they look at a picture and they go, oh yeah, 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 my wife made me buy that jacket, but I didn't really want to wear it that day, but she said I should. He wouldn't have thought of that unless he's looking at that picture, but the picture has unlocked that memory. And I do that for all my interviews, because the results are never less than sensational. But, if along the way, someone tells me something, that I, I'm sitting there listening to it thinking, oh, 
I'm not so sure about that. It doesn't quite fit the time frame, or that isn't quite right. I won't use it. Can I use any, the analogy I'm going to use now? Is yes. When I first started going to Liverpool for the convention 20 years ago, yeah. every cab I got into, yeah. the cab driver was in the same class as Lena. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Big class size. He must have been the class of 150 people. Yeah. 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 So that's the analogy that I'm using. Yeah. yeah, but in my book I go and get the school admission records. And then I just, I know who was in John's class because I can see it on paper and I can see their first name, middle name, surname, so that's easy to find people if you've got their initials. And then I start looking. I think it's also fair to point out where you do have opposing stories. Mm -hmm. You have both stories, like so and so, I can't think of an example, so and so remembers this. Yes. So and so remembers this. Yes. So the truth lies somewhere in the yeah, middle. Yeah, and it's not for me to decide. Um, so I, I will do that because I really, I just want to be the person who weaves this. And naturally, what I choose to use in terms of my research material is shaped by me. So there is a certain element of editorial, you know, overseeing there. But apart from that, it's all direct first-hand stuff. And if it doesn't stand up, I will not use it. Yeah. Hi Mark. Um, part of the publicity for the book, um, which you published in the newspapers, was an unreleased photo of uh, Lennon and Paul from 1961, yeah. with Paul wearing the glasses. I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the history of the photo, and whether it would be actually included in the deluxe version of the book. Yes, every picture that's in this book is in the deluxe as well, and there are more pictures in that. Yeah. Um, it was just a picture that I got when I went to Liverpool for a convention about 20 odd years ago. Um, you know, there are, when you go to Liverpool, you can still meet people who have got things. Uh, and I just bought it privately and haven't used it until now. As for why Paul's, well, it's a joke picture, so that's why he's wearing glasses, because he didn't need to wear glasses. I think they're John's glasses, because John didn't get the black horn rings until later. Uh, and I haven't really studied it too closely. Um, there is a tendency for people to think that, you know, again, people who less infused by the story can think what's all this about you know 600 pages of how you know how often they had toast you know <laughs> what did they have for breakfast and what underpants were they wearing that i, I hate that kind of mm. comment because it's not about any of that mm. there is a level of trivia that i won't go to and i only ever go as far as i personally am comfortable uh, and i i'm not looking for trivia anyway i'm looking for color i'm looking for i liken this book to a jigsaw puzzle Imagine a jigsaw puzzle with millions of pieces, and it's never been put down together before. I'm out there the whole time, and part of my professional job is to look for as many of these pieces as possible, and to find where they fit and put them down, and you actually get <coughs> pictures emerging. You can also still see where the gaps are, and those gaps may or may not ever be filled. But my, my theory is, if you look at the, if you have it as a jigsaw puzzle, you can see it both in close-up detail and you can see it in context when you step back. And I'm trying to achieve both those effects in the book at the same time. And it is possible. So I'm just really doing a jigsaw here. Which is a marvellous jigsaw. Mm. Well, it's, it's the most interesting jigsaw there ever was. It always makes it, well, with one thing we didn't mention, things like um, Nowhere Boy. Yes. It's such a fascinating story. Why did they have to go and change and yeah. add things? And yeah. There's no need to do anything but just follow the story. Yes, uh, again, um, there's a tendency for authors to dress things up slightly, to embroider them in some way, to add layers to them. And actually, you can take all those layers away because it's already the deepest, richest, most interesting, most colourful story imaginable. You do not need to add anything to this book to make it good. Another thing as well that I forgot to mention was this story. When you were corresponding between uh, as you were writing it, you were saying about you've got to think logically about what would have happened. If you don't know what happened, think logically. One of the things I, I remember being quite satisfied how we resolved it was where John met Paul. Yes. It's always been quoted yes. as he met at the church hall. I won't spoil it for anybody. But I've got a little bit of a uh, quote from Colin Hansen, who was a drummer with the quarry man. Mark had got some maps of Walton, mm. and between the two of us, Mm. We established this, with the way you think about it now, how it would have happened, mm. how it weaves its way yes. to the meeting, yeah. just makes so much more sense it now. Does. It does, and that, that, that meeting of them, uh, incidentally, isn't it extraordinary that the day they met, John Lennon was singing Come Go With Me to mm. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's always told. He was singing Come Go With Me. But he said, yeah. hold on a minute, he's singing Come Go With Me to Paul McCartney yeah. the day they meet. So, you know, what better subtitle could there have been? Um, that is a chapter in the book. The, the, the chapters generally are fairly long, but there are some short chapters. There's another short chapter about the trip that John and Paul made to Paris, which was quite pivotal, as I say. Uh, and they help punctuate the longer chapters, these yes, short ones. Uh, beautiful mm. little snippets of yeah. stories that come into the, yeah. the big picture. It, absolutely, yeah. I make a point of researching documents uh, because memories are fallible, but documents are not. And if you've got a letter or some document, whatever it might be, any kind, that has a date on it, uh, and you can see who it's to and who it's from, and it might have, if it's a letter, it will have, you know, company letterhead on it with the names of the directors. And it's a moment in time that is preserved in some way, either as a top copy or a carbon copy. And I love archives and I love finding all these things. And there is an appeal in the book for anyone who has anything that they think they might be the only ones who've got, and possibly it's not generally known, then I would like, I would be honoured if anyone would like to volunteer what they have to me. I don't need to own it, I don't even need to handle it, just a photograph of it or a photocopy or a scan. So if, any, if there's anyone in this room who in their Beatles collection has something that they've acquired along the way that they think I might be interested in, I would like to know, chances are I'd have seen it but I need to see everything just to find the things I haven't seen before. Um, and so there is, uh, I've got a website now and there's a page on that for people to go, get in touch if they've got something. Rocklewison.net, I mentioned Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And there's also a, book, a, a website for the book as well. Yeah, uh, Beatles Biography. Yeah, be, uh, Beatlesbiography.com and the American publishers have a website. The internet's well. great. I keep reading people telling me what I've been thinking all these years. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're, they're very rarely right. Um, it had a working title at the beginning, which was fab. Um, and I chose that simply because this was a three volume book and that was a three letter word and I, wanted, I thought that would just be good for the proposal. Uh, but I never really intended to call it fad because it would convey the wrong image, it would make it look like this is a fan's book. And although I am a fan, I'm also very objective in this book. I wouldn't want to write the book in any other way other than to be completely neutral, as if I didn't even like them in the first place. Um, so fab it wasn't. but. I wanted a title for the series, uh, and that came up as All These Years, which was actually thought of by a friend of mine, partly because it's all these, it's a history book, so it is about all these years. Secondly, it's because they've been in our lives all these years. Uh, and thirdly, because it is actually a Beatles line, the act you've known for all these years. So I didn't want to go down the, the hackneyed route of using a song title. So obviously I was either not going to do it or I was going to find a subtle way of doing it. Um, and as for Tune In, I wanted something that would explain this story in the sense of ultimately it's the story of the people who are in the book. And they tune into one another. Paul tunes into John and George pulls in, tunes into John and Paul. And Ringo tunes into the three of them, and George Martin tunes in, and Brian tunes in, and they tune into rock and roll music, and they tune into Radio Luxembourg, and they tune into the Light Program, and they tune into Six Five Special and Oh Boy. And it just struck me that this is where, if you want to show the process of people who become simpatico with one another, that is the process of tuning in to each other's wavelength. So I just thought that was a good time. Another little instance there, tuning in, you've got them listening to the crickets don't ever change in the van for the first time. Oh yeah. You know, who, who else could research that? The first time they would have heard don't ever change by the crickets. Yeah, it's such a fundamental <laughs> song in their development. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, such a fundamental song in the Beatles development, uh, don't ever change by the crickets. Um, not so much because it's the crickets, more because it's written by Goffin and King who were the primary influence on the Beatles in 62, when they get the recording culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and they drove down to Abbey Road for their first session. And I just thought, and I said to Neil, did you have a radio in the van? Yeah, yeah, we, we used to try and find whatever was on that was like the music we liked. So I went to the BBC program records, the microfilm program records, and I found out what was on the BBC live program while they were driving down. And there's Don't Ever Change. I was like, oh, that's where they heard it. 
great. They heard it in the van going down to Abbey Road for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and similarly, they also heard a record by Bert Canford, who was their producer in Hamburg. He was played on the radio. And you can imagine in the van going, oh, there's Bert, you know, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. <laughs> I don't imagine what they did say, because that would be wrong. But it's just, a, it's just a, it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rock has been incredible. Thank you. The book is incredible. Everybody should buy a copy. Thank you.